Hello. Is it okay if I don't use mic? Can everyone, can people behind me hear me if I don't use mic? Yeah, one of the occupational hazards of being a teacher is uh, being trained to be loud all the time. So I hope uh, uh, you can hear me without using mic. Alright, so uh, good evening everyone. I guess I'm probably one of the few people in this room who neither is a programmer nor am I a data scientist. I, first and foremost, I'm a teacher. Uh, I teach in the daytime in a normal secondary school in Alma Bukit Batajam, and I run my own non-profit after my first work um, in Alma Bukit Batajam as well. So I have two jobs. Like our minister say, right, it's never enough to have only one job. Do a career, hashtag. Right, so uh, I see normal secondary school students all the time. The school that I teach in is a B40 school. Um, my school, the one that I teach in, is ranked number two from behind in everything. Um, the only one that's behind us is one other school in mainland, uh, out of 34 schools in, in the whole Penang. So, one of the things I realized when I got into teaching six years ago, it's been six years since I stepped into the classroom as a Teach from Malaysia, uh, as a teach from Malaysia fellow being sent to a high school in Penang, I realized that the world that the students live in is a very different world from the world that I know. Some of the things are still the same. Um, 12 years ago, I learned science and mathematics in BN. They went through a few changes. Now they're still learning BN, so that thing is still the same. Everything else is different, totally different. I remember last time I had to prepare for debate competition by reading newspaper. Nowadays, you can get ready-made debate script online right away. So that's a huge difference. Information is available at the fingertips, just like that, for the kids 10 years on. We have all know about the IR 4.0, how the world is going to be a different world 5 years, 10 years from now on. Um, but are we doing enough to prepare the students for the job market of the future? <clears throat> Those of you familiar with the game Civilization, you will know that the ultimate age in the end of the game is not an atomic age, but it's an information age. And indeed, that is the world that we live in nowadays. We live in an information age, where information is the only currency that matters in all worlds. Business, education, commerce, investment, that's the only thing that's, a, that's, the only thing that's most valuable to everyone, information. The more information you know, the more benefit you can gather. The whole world thrives on information asymmetry, whereas people with more information are able to gain advantage from those with less information. Thus, one of the things that we do, one of the things that, that sparked the creation of Arus Academy, a non-profit aimed to serve the B40 community, is we want to make learning relevant. Ten years on, we are still <clears throat> ten years on, we are still teaching us the same thing, the same way. In the classroom, in a 40 student setting, teacher talk, chalkboard, replaced by blackboard, but it's still the same thing, same thing over and over again. As such, in Arus, we make three different programs aimed at three different segment of the society. We have the Maker Academy which focuses a lot on microcontroller programming and innovation and creation. No, nope, it's not the feedback from the mic. Uh, we have a primary school program, Girls in Engineering, Mathematics and Science. We believe that all girls are gems and they deserve to be exposed to wonderful robotics in since young. Uh, we're going to challenge the gender stereotype. And lastly, to prepare the students for an information age, we created mathematics, informatics, and data science. It's essentially a data science slash programming class for the underprivileged community. It also has a very nice acronym to it, which is MINDS, MINDS. We all use our MINDS. Um, how it works is that we use Google Classroom, we use Rapid, and we have this sort of team going around our classroom where we pretend uh, we create this world where the students are junior cadet police trying to solve crimes using computer science and technology. It sounds far-fetched, but I can tell you definitely that it's not very far in the future. That's what we'll be using. Using data science to predict when crimes will happen pre cop you know, from Minority Report. Uh, essentially, this is our syllabus. As you can see, it's not that much different from any data science courses from the adult world. I mean, of course, the rigor is much less compared to the adult world, but in general, the content is still pretty much almost the same. We teach students Python programming basic that covers from variable all the way to list operation. Uh, we teach students a mathematical concept, and these are mathematical concepts that they will have learned in their classroom otherwise. These are topics that you learn in your secondary school maths. You learn about coordinates, you learn about progression, you learn about matrices, you learn about simple descriptive statistics in secondary school. And the third section is what you don't learn in school. We teach them 
um, NumPy, we use NumPy library, we use Pandas, we use uh, Matplotlib, and we use Seaborn. These are the four libraries that we live by. Um, how does it work? Every lesson, we provide them with an introductory uh, explanation, and then we allow us to create to solve challenges on Replit. These are some of the simple questions that we have on Replit. As you can see, it's very, very simple programming question. Range from creating uh, multiplication to uh, uh, programming test on whether number is divisible by two by three. Those of you familiar with programming, this is very similar to one of the tests which kind of slipped my tongue on my mouth now. Uh, that you have to create input based on whatever number they receive. And it goes to more difficult tasks, things that integrate mathematics, things that require them to use the problem solving mindset to decipher the question and to come with a solution, to create a function that accurately map the input and output. Um, so as you can see, there are questions about mathematics, there are questions about Fibonacci number. And for each case, we have a story that goes with it. So the students feel like they are really solving time, but it's actually just mathematics, combinational question. To one of the challenge at the end of the class, they are, are going to analyze a ready-made data. This was created by analyzing the, the best, sorry, I don't want to bring political politics here, but one of the most exciting general election in our nation history, the 2018 GE result. So this was created using uh, a simple CSV, using pandas and also Seaborn on visualizing the, the general election result. Of course, there's nothing new that we don't, we don't know from here. Uh, everything else is history. We know who gets which state and whatnot. So some of the things that I've learned over the past two years of running the same program is that what well, attitude is king. Why do I say that? Programming oftentimes is not how good you are at solving questions, but how resilient you are after countless time of failing. Um, I like to compare this to doing an question. It's really difficult. It's so difficult that you want to give up. But the joy of solving it at the end of three pages of calculation, that is priceless. And for students to be able to reach that stage, to be able to have that resilient attitude, that's what that matters. It doesn't matter how smart they are, but having the resilience to solve questions, to solve problems, that's what that counts. Um, there's no correlation with academic achievement and also coding skills. As students who in school, they are just an average student, but they're excellent at solving computational problems. Um, our students have very quick problem solving skills. Obviously, there's nothing new. Um, we in Malaysia like to always come our education system, but I've seen firsthand. Students lack problem solving skills. We are not starting at zero. I have to tell you, to be frank, we are starting at some negative number. And it's very important, it's important for us to actually push the students beyond, actually beyond the negative range, to even be in positive range. Because our students, their starting point is not zero. And lastly, we have to keep back the conversation of CS education. Why do I say that? You might think, whatever that I'm doing, if you notice when I mentioned Python, I say that's what they learn in school, which is indeed the truth. Computer science has been introduced in our system uh, in the form of two subjects. In Form 1, it's called, Form 1, Form 2, Form 3, it's called Asa Science Computer, Computer Science Basic, and Form 1, Form 5, it's called Science Computer. Now, the thing about the Malaysian education system is that once something is in the system, then it comes to the exercise book. So it's very important for us to take back the conversation on CS education. We don't want students to just be learn to just be learning how to program ADM machine reply. You put in money, you feed up money. These are basic, basic, basic programming skills that even a primary school child can do. What we want is our students to be able to take the programming language and make something out. We to solve a problem using programming language, which is not seen in our society. These books, they are just pages and pages of programming practice question in the form of writing. Simple math solution in the form of writing, you know, ATM machine reply or like calculate average score, which is fine for low level kind of solving, problem solving skill, but it's not fine if you want to have a nature of problem solver. That is not what CS education is. That is not what computer science education is. Computer science is the art of solving problem. And if we do not take back the conversation on that, our students will be trained to be a generation of coding monkeys, which is just coding, coding, coding without actually thinking about the problem. So, Arus does a lot of things. These are some of the main things that we do, aside from running 
um, charity program. We are a non-profit organization. That means we do not charge our students. How do we get money? We try our very best to work with MOE so that we don't create monkeys, coding monkeys. We create people who actually can solve problems. We write curriculum content for them. We create lesson plans for them. We upskill their teachers. When the two subjects were introduced two years ago, three years ago, it was a shock in the system. Nobody knows how to do programming. And to these teachers who have been teaching ICT for the past many years, all they know is how to teach this is a mouse, this is red, this is road. This is not computer science. This is teaching basic things that you just Google it in five seconds. Our teachers are also being taught, or more so that they are teaching the students how to do HTML programming. Sorry to, sorry to say this, but I don't think HTML is real programming. HTML is just very basic rudimentary programming that deserves no place in CS education. And yet, the teachers are expected to teach Python programming at Form 2, SQL programming at Form 3, Java and C++ at Form, sorry, Java at Form 4, and JavaScript and PHP in Form 5. Form 1, they teach Scratch, which is super easy, so that's no, not a problem in there. But Form 2, 3, 4, 5, that's when you see the problem start happening. And we are trying our very best in ARUS to try to upskill teachers. We run teacher training workshop. We work with uh, teacher training organization. We work with PSC to train teachers so that we can, at least in our locus of control, make sure that there's still something going on in the school. Uh, for one thing I know, teachers tend to skip all these programming lessons or just copy code and expect students to do it. Till date, um, this is something I took from last year's slide. Uh, our number is higher now. We are working with government, we are working with uh, MDAC to create module for RPT in primary school to teach them using microbit. Uh, with what we have done so far, we have run programs with 1,000 students at least. We have run training for 700 teachers. We have created 12 modules for the ministry and we run 16 CSR programs till date. So the, for the past six and a half years, sorry, for the past five years, we've been doing programs with the students. Our students have gone very far from winning national level innovation competition to winning international level competition. And from there, we built their characters, we built their leadership skills, we built their grit, we built their resilience. And most importantly, we have the right attitude for a job force of the future. And this is where I like to introduce you to one of my students. So I brought one of my students here. Uh, he's been working on a project with his friends to create a flood mitigation system in Penang. As you all know, Penang is a place very prone to flood, more so on the mainland. We live in Bukit Matajam, where you see us in the news sometimes when there's a major flood. So I created a program that aims to collect data and I will let him tell the rest of the story. I'm sorry that I need a mic. I'm, a, I'm not a teacher. <laughs> so, one week ago, um, there are tons of rubbish that, was, uh, that were found in um, Taman Sri Rambai in Penang Mainland. So, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lo Chia Jing, and I'm one of the students of this teacher. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. Okay, I'm here today to introduce you my project, the flood mitigation system. I'm sorry I didn't bring the project here, but yeah, I will explain. Um, maybe a little bit, yeah. So, as we know, uh, clock drain is one of the main reasons that causes flood in the whole world, especially in Malaysia. So, my team and I have um, come up a solution where we collect three, three kinds of data in the drain, and we analyze it, and we, and we tell um, um, the final answer, is it clocked? So um, maybe I would like to introduce a little bit about how our government function now today. Um, so our local council function is like, they will mix routines, so they will go every drain and see, is that clocked? But um, that is not efficient enough. So my project, 
is a project where it collects data. So when one of the dream clouds, it will notify our user, especially local council. So by that, our local council may easily manage um, their workers uh, to clean up the drain without doing um, routine, which are not valuable. So um, I actually done a, a lot of work to improve that, and I also have a website to um, filter data and for data scientists like you to analyze data uh, to predict data. Uh, to, uh, sorry, to predict next flood. So. I'm here today to learn how can I use all my data to predict the next plot. So we have so many data. How can I use uh, the machine learning concept to predict the next plot? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, remember earlier on I said academic achievement and what they can do is not related. Um, this student just finished from five last year. He just finished from five. You would have imagined a student like that would be an all A student, no? but that's not the truth. Uh, you can ask me how many A's you get, but I can tell you, you can count all the A's in one hand, maybe one finger. All right. So my point is that there are students like that, and can you believe it? I tell you, this boy come from the bottom two school in in, a, in the whole Philippine state. Also a caveat: the project is not implemented yet. Um, they managed to meet up with uh, YB students team and YB students team gave him some contact uh, but the project is not ready to go mainstream here. Once it does, we hope that this will be a real project that will contribute to the whole bigger idea of open data um, so that people can make use of data to do whatever uh, analysis they want on the data. Um, right, so to come back to what Arus does, um, one reason why I want to share here is that what we've been doing is very isolated. Um, we realize that. I am not a programmer. Uh, I have a minor in CS, but that's as much CS education as I got. Um, I want to know what the industry is actually doing. Uh, I do a lot of my own research on what data science is, and what data science teach, and what data science learn. But I don't think that's enough. Uh, I need to be in touch with the real world. I need to be in touch with the real uh, flesh and you know, real data scientists in the flesh, instead of just me working isolated in the cloud somewhere. Um, what's next? Maybe there can be a collaboration of creating the next generation content for my. Maybe there can be what's next for Python programming besides learning it through the data science lens. Or it can be, you know, can we create a more simple, toned down version of the, I mean, a more beef up version of the class for the adults, a simple introduction of data analytics? Can we collaborate? If you are working on something with education, can we collaborate further? If you are working on something on data analytics, can we collaborate further? And if you know if your pocket is deep enough and you want to support some charity work, talk to me. Uh, I have lots of charity for the support. Um, can we have some kind of uh, financial aid from the uh, attendees? And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to present. Question from the audience. We have time. Huh? It was 30 minutes. So I think my, my first speakers, they will always decide to make a little bit less. No question? Ah. Introduce yourself when you want. Yeah, uh, I'm Chua. I'm also from Kim uh, I'm very interested on his uh, project and uh, I'm curious that how. How he gathered the data? Where's the data came from? Is it came from sensor that we yeah, store and we, Yeah, we actually built sensor. We use Arduino. Do you familiar with uh, Arduino? Yeah, we are using Arduino and some components uh, to get data. So we actually have uh, we three D print out a container, which uh, co um, combine all the components inside and some lithium uh, battery and a solar panel to work in the drain. So with that, we also use some uh, radio frequency to receive data from the train. Yeah, that's, that's how we collect data. And what do you measure exactly? Uh, we are measuring, uh, so we are using flex sensor where we were um, put on the grill inside the monsoon drain. So when 
got uh, rubbish or something push the grill, we can feel the pressure and we get the data. And, and we will know that there are something clogged. And we also use a uh, capacitive sensor to sense the water level and also a rain sensor to sense the weather. So for those uninitiated, my Arduino is a microcontroller. It's essentially a mini computer. That is the size of a credit card. How many of you are working on this project? Just you or? Uh, four of us. Okay, and you started from scratch. And there was nothing? Um, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 There's a franchise in that story. Yeah, yeah, we start from zero. Yeah. 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 You know how much it costs for the, for the one, one station? Um, we have a transmitter and a receiver. The receiver, we just need one and the transmitter can be a lot. So the transmitter costs us around 100 ringgit um, together with the 3D printer. Lah. And this one, uh, the receiver is yeah, around 50 ringgit. Oh, it will update every five minutes. Um, actually, we are using uh, a Raspberry Pi to, to, as, a, as a server to control all the data. Have you five minutes throughout the day or once it rains? No, uh, every five minutes when it starts. So it starts, then you send the message, then five minutes ago, uh, sorry, uh, five minutes later, then update again, then update again, update again. It's like a loop. So, hi, I'm Ethan, and I work at CryptoChart. I think you, this will be a question for both of you that you can answer. So, um, you touched a lot on doing technical kind of uh, topics within your program, but within data science, there's a lot that goes with it beyond the technical, like trying to understand the information that you receive and taking insights and then figuring out how you move forward based on the insights that you receive. Is this something that you're also addressing within the program? And then for you and your project, um, working with governments or like any other external stakeholders can definitely be a challenge. So how do you foresee making sure that if you get the backing that they're going to actually follow through because they can just say like, Oh yes, we have this information and that actually move forward, but how do you potentially like make sure that the information that you're receiving and understanding will then there will be action taken forward? Oh, that's my part. Uh, I understand uh, where you're coming from about how data science is just more than technical. Uh, unfortunately right now we focus a lot on the technical because that's a very technical thing to teach and there's a it's, it's easier to measure that as compared to a non-technical thinking skill. Obviously, when we move towards that direction, so if you have any idea how we could do that, um, definitely you can chat afterwards. So, for my question is that, uh, um, what's your question again? <laughs> <laughs> how to make sure that yeah, you don't take action after you give the data? Um, how to make sure? Um, the, the, my, um, my project function is um, when we sense cloud, we notify the local council. Then the local council asks their workers to go. Uh, if they don't take any action, um, it will be a waste. And yeah, how to prevent? Did, did they do it? Did they send people who you know? Uh, Does it work? The project is not implemented yet. Ah, in, so in my so imagination, it works like that. <laughs> so, so it's your idea that you, you, you could potentially potentially like interact with the uh, local authorities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, I, it's great to hear your project. Um, help me understand, what, what year are you again? Or when do you finish school? Uh, I just finished my secondary school. Nice, nice. 
So I'm curious, after, before, maybe before working with these guys and going through the program and being exposed to this and where you are now, what, what, what is different for you personally? Um, and just kind of maybe perspective, just share a little bit about that, the, the human interest side. Oh, yeah. So, use the microphone. <laughs> uh, there are uh, actually a lot of difference. So before I started joining Aris Academy, I was uh, a student in the school who don't know what to do in the future. So, yeah, as, as you guys know, my school is the uh, second last school in mainland, in Penang. And when I was studying in the school without Aris Academy, I don't know my passion. I don't know what is my passion is. I just go to school like normal guys and yeah, waiting for <laughs> really school. But after I joined Aris Academy, I actually found my passion and I can see my future. I can see the, uh, the picture of my future. What, what will I be? What can I do with this kind of technologies? Thank you. about the, the interface you are using? We, Roughly. Yeah. C can you, I, I'm not very familiar with it, can you tell me more about it? Uh, it's basically an online code interpreter. I know I've been receiving a lot of requests from my friends who are programmers say to use Jupyter. Unfortunately, I, I don't know much about Jupyter. I don't know exactly a better choice. But it actually allows me to create computer science assignments and assign the students. And they do simple input output actions, so I don't have to actually check for one by one. I said I wait and score it, they fill out the right output based on the input. Uh, that's that's fine with that. And the good thing about Reflex is that it also runs uh, not all, but it runs quite a bit of uh, data science packages like Panda, C1, all these things run in the on the online interface. So, so, in, um, so you, you say that, uh, okay, it's, it's uh, in fact matching the output with what the student is doing, right? Uh, so th there are many ways usually like to solve a problem. Um, so how do you uh, solve for that? Like, like how do you go one by one with the students? How does it work? So there are, there are, it's true there are many different sort of problems, uh, which I don't really care what ways to use, as long as your algorithm somehow gives up the correct output based on my input. You should have loaded in like 20 different inputs, so there's no way they can predict what kind of input they are putting. Um, well, it's true that the, the, the input output matching is very limited, so when we move on to the later part, when they actually touch on the actual data science packages, I have to verify some information myself. So that's the downside of it, because there's no way for me to like, create a graph, because there's so many that create a graph. And I cannot just simply do image matching. Uh, but for the lower level, let's say I would, I would probably be teaching conditionals, you know, make a function that fits out the, the Like for example, a question of practice four. This can easily be done using a replica, where it's just an input output matching. But obviously, you can choose to do it x times x, or you can do a follow to times x multiple times. It's really up to the student. But all I care about is that you can create an algorithm to actually correctly uh, identify the steps to solve the question that I put out there. Yeah. You should use it if you are looking for very lightweight, um, you know, type of interpreter. Questions? Okay, I go on. Ah, here. Ah, near. Ah, you don't need the mic, I remember. Uh, yeah, so, so you mentioned you teach them mathematics at the same time, or they're learning it alongside their regular mathematics syllabus, right? So, in our batches, like in advanced syllabus, or like one advanced syllabus, or one? We don't specifically say that, oh, now you are from one, so coming in, I don't teach MS, we just treat it as the same. So, if you are from one, if I'm introducing a form four concept, let's say uh, progression. Uh, janja, arithmetic, janja, geometry, arithmetic, and geometric profession. I will still teach it to you. Uh, it doesn't matter your age. So I don't explicitly match it to say you from one, you only from one math. Because let's face it, knowledge has really no academic level. Um, if you can understand basic, you know, addition, subtraction, you can probably understand uh, progression. Um, how do we do it? Is that it could be you know this week is entirely Python, and then we talk about the math concept, and then we go back to Python when you use Python to solve the math concept question. 
So we, we alternate that way, but it's not force it. Um, for example, a very natural way to introduce metrics is when we introduce a two-dimensional list. Because then you can do a uh, metric operation by using the 2D list. Or a very good way to introduce progression is actually during the time when they learn about a for loop or a while loop, where they can repetitively, repetitively to create a, a number sequence. So we try to make mathematics seamlessly integrate into the whole programming uh, context so that it won't feel very out of place. Because ideally, we, we in our ability that knowledge is not individual silo. It's not you learn bio, that's all you do. You learn MS, that's all you do in MS. If you go to higher level in of learning, you probably see that you know, things are just all mashed up together. It's especially even more when you're in CS. CS and mathematics, I guess it fits in a very nice topic. CS and mathematics, they are just two sides of the same coin. Uh, in fact, CS is built upon mathematics foundation. So it's very it's only natural that we try to put the two together. Yeah. How many students do you currently teach per program? Unfortunately it's a very niche thing. Uh, we our largest intake was last year about 14 students. Our smallest intake was the first time when I ran it about six students. Sorry, was it 14 or 14? 14. 14. 14. Yeah. And how would you say of those 14 like one years of year? We take in secondary school students, so it doesn't matter what level you are at. But one of the problems that I find is the number one, students, they, I will never speak from students I work with, I work with the lower income uh, B14 groups. I don't work with, I don't work with EM high school students, I don't work with NAPRI schools, I don't work with GC or Chongli, I work with normal day-to-day -day secondary school students. Is that they are very intimidated by programming. So think programming is only for those who are elite and those who are like, super genius, which is not true. Um, everyone, anyone with the right attitude, with the right training, you can be genius if you want to, it's all up to you. So one of the challenges we face is number one, that they always feel intimidated, they always think that they are stupid enough, not smart enough to do these things. Number two is that um, it's just too many distracting out there. Compared to spending two hours learning programming, they could just spend two hours playing QBG or whatever the latest game is. So that's my two challenges. But of course, like I say, we have never, we have yet to work with higher ability students. So we, higher ability, by that I mean the students from a more affluent background, students from more high academic achievement students. So I don't know how that would go with that group of students. Um, I would like to explore that uh, part of the student population if I could. Um, yeah. Um, okay, I have more questions. Um, so I'm, I'm not very familiar with the uh, Malaysian education system. So when you talk about formatting like that, I have no idea what you're talking about, but it doesn't matter. Um, how, who, who or how did you design the, the curriculum? Like the content, what you want uh, the students to learn? So before the introduction of these subjects uh, into the school, the ASK subject was introduced two years ago. That was the first time when I started running a program. Uh, how do I decide what to teach in programming? So the first time I do it, it's very easy. I take the first two weeks of my computer introduction to computer science topics and I just Stretch it to eight weeks. Uh, but then, when they have the, the syllabus and the curriculum requirement, I sort of base it upon that. Uh, even though it's empty, but it sort of gives a very nice border of what I should teach. For example, I do not touch on object oriented at all because that is, I think, that is not relevant and that is also not taught in secondary school level. Um, I included a lot on variables, loops, and conditionals because, number one, that's the basic language for learning language. Number two, um, that is so highly emphasized in the secondary school universe. Um, as for, so we build a lot of our content around form 2 Python syllabus and also a bit of form 4 syllabus. But they are more higher level, which you don't touch on. For example, in form 5, they actually learn to interface with SQL language, for example. That is sort of beyond, number one is beyond my level. <laughs> number two is beyond what the student is needed to know. Because they are not specialized in it. Um, trying to provide like a very introductory level uh, of understanding of CS for the students. If we make it, the way I put it is like, learning is just like teaching someone to reach for something that's a little bit beyond their reach. So if they tiptoe a bit, they can reach it. But if we put it too far higher, they'll give up. So it's always to balance between too easy and too difficult. So I have to make sure that it's just slightly above their level, so they work hard to work it, but not too high above their level. And do, do, you, uh, do you have constraint by the uh, authorities, meaning that uh, you have to teach this kind of uh, stuff? Or, we, or you are totally free? We are a learning center outside of school, we can do whatever we want. Oh, if okay. we want to. 
but uh, we try to make it relevant for students. So we don't want the students to come in and learn something and then they don't find use in the school. So some of our students that actually take something in school, they do find it to be easier when they're actually learning in school. Or sometimes they become the mini teacher in the classroom because their teacher is not familiar with Python. So they end up becoming their friend's teacher, which is actually sad because that's the state of most CS education teachers in Malaysia. Um, they really need the support to actually teach the subject and even the paper. I'm just curious, how do you how do you measure success? So when you look at the program at the end of a term, a year, how do you say good, bad, expected results? That's a very good question. That's a question that we are still grappling with. Uh, how do we measure success in an educational intervention? Um, obviously, we don't want to measure based on exams because that's going back to what we don't want to be. Um, two ways. Number one, we try to measure through project. In our big academy, uh, the students' success is determined by a final project that they actually solve the problem. In fact, their group, um, they, they weren't in that program, but then they, they would have created some, also have created some project like that in their big academy duration with us. And then let's just see how far the students are going to do the project for them. Um, in MICE, we try to make the students do an independent data research project, but I'm limited by three things. Number one, the availability of uh, it's relevant to daily life. Obviously, I can get data from World Bank and then scientific data from here and there. But these are data that's not relevant to students. Why would I want to learn about what the people of Uganda thinks about their president, for example? Unfortunately, in relation data, uh, we use a lot of data from data which we know and which is the open relation data repository, but it's still very limited. So we're limited by the kind of data that students can get. Number two, obviously we can say, you know what, why don't you go and collect the data? But to collect a large enough data to make it meaningful, that's a, even a daunting task for adults, but more of children. So we ideally want to measure student success by the project that they produce, uh, sorry, by a research project that they produce, but they can get. But in reality, we, are, we have too many constraints. So even for example, last year, that was the first time I see a generation data being so openly transparent about the voters come about that. So that's one set of Malaysian data that they can use that might be interesting of the students. Um, but that's a very rare instance. Obviously, if you guys have any interesting data set that you don't mind in the open source students, we welcome that. You can let that data feed the students and let them find something away. Um, so to go back forward to your first question, how do you mention the through a research project, limited by all these constraints. Um, I know you only use maths at the moment. What about other real life industry examples like finance or manufacturing? You know, finance is very valuable for its manufacturing. Are you keen to open up their, their minds to different industries? And I know you're not so keen on opening up to global level data. At the moment where we work, we work with different industries all over the world. So sometimes opening people's minds up to different things that are happening in different parts of the world can help us as well in the local community. Well, how do you think you can? Is, it, is this going to be well received by our students? To be honest, I'm not sure. Uh, it all depends on what kind of data is available. When I say global data, what I mean is like, um, so World Bank has this huge set of data. There's like 200 different items of like 100 over different countries of like 30 over years. That's a huge, huge set of data. But a lot of these things in the data, number one, they are not complete. Number two, they carry very little meaning for the students. For example, the mortality rate of, sorry, the maternal mortality rates of countries over the past 20 years, for example. I mean, to an economist, to a sociologist, to a political scientist, to a developmental specialist, that is something very interesting. But to a secondary school student, that is just numbers. So, um, yeah, I would definitely be open to seeing what kind of data we can feed into students. But industrial data can be interesting as well. For example, I'm just giving an example. If someone can give them a data of all the crap pick up and drop off location feeling, that is a very interesting set of data. They can get something interesting out of it. And the students being the Kimochi that they are, they will be interested to know. But they are not that Kimochi that they want to know about the mortality rates of Uganda in 1995. Do, do you get what I mean? Yeah, uh, that, I that kind of but I think uh, what Ethan was saying just now, that data analysis component, if you added that you could get more out of that productivity. True, true. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just talking from experience. So, it's something interesting for, for the team. Definitely, I'm open to explore it. Like I said, I'm 
coming from a very educated point of view, I, I, to put it in a crude way, I have no idea what the industry is doing. Uh, all I know is what I've been doing the past two years. So I will definitely be welcoming you know, um, like actual, real world feedback on how we can make it better. Because we want to make it better. Uh, we want ourselves to be, like my student, I've been brainwashing him to actually pursue study in data science or computer science because I was telling him how this will be a job that definitely won't be replaced in the near future as compared to like an accountant or a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, we have a question on the back. Yeah, um, I would just like to say uh, your, your, your students are, they have applied what they have learned. That's very, very good. That is why you go to school for. But the thing is that uh, as a teacher, do you ever teach them how to monetize what they learn or what they have put in experimental? Because this is very important. And data analysis is one of the most uh, jobs are everywhere. You can use it in insurance, in, in transportation, everywhere. In our daily life, we need data analysis. You are the future. And so I think you need to tell the, the, the student there's a bright future and they can do it. And uh, that the, whatever needs to be analyzed, normally it comes from the company. My son is a data analyst in France. Yes, and uh, they, they, they don't have to worry about the data. The data will be given. And they just know how to break them open, analyze them, and suit whatever company, different company will ask for different things. Some of them will say, okay, uh, I want to set half the, the, the people working for how to do it. Or an insurance company will say, oh, at what age this fellow will die? Or an airplane company will say, at, after how many hours this plane will crash? And a medical company will say, after taking this medicine, you will see. So these are all data, they get from data. So uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I believe in open data analysis, I believe in open everything, but I also believe that open everything doesn't pay for bill. Uh, um, we tell our students that their project, their project is good, some will be willing to pay money for it, but that's as far as I go. Uh, we don't want students to be you know, very money-minded. You know money, I don't help you solve the problem. We want our students to be genuinely, how to say, this is probably my personal philosophy, that if you do good, good things will come to you. If you do something good, probably good money will come to you, uh, hopefully. Uh, as for monetizing, I've been telling the students, you know, this is actually the job of the future. I show them data from Job Street. It's one of the most highly paid jobs in Malaysia. Without going offshore, if you want more money, go offshore, but you'll be away from Malaysia for like months. This is a job you can just work in the comfort of your house. You get like same salary. Um, yeah, I've been telling them that. Uh, but ultimately, like I say, we can only tell them how amazing this thing is. Uh, I just them to take up that job or that role or that career if it's something of their interest. I have a comment on this one. Uh, data analysts that receive a clean data set, that's a niche, right? Like usually you receive something that is dirty, you don't know where it comes from, it's like all over the place. So knowing how to clean data before doing any analysis, that's a very, very valuable skill, I think. Uh, we still have a few minutes. Any other question? If you guys want to visit, just drop by, our address is up there. We are near, we are in Alma, the most happening place in Bukit Penaja, the most happening place in the mainland. So I've lived in, I've lived in Penang for the past uh, six and a half years, and I think I've been brainwashed to love mainland and hate coming to the island. Uh, Say yeah. thank you for today, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I try not to come to mainland, uh, to, 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 to Josh Chinese, like just so hard to find parking. <laughs> or you have to park somewhere very far at the mountain hill parking and walk like one kilometer to come here. Yeah. yeah. We do some program in PSC, so that means I have to come here sometimes. PSC is just next door. Um, I hate coming here on a Sunday because there just means no parking here, no parking there. I probably have to park in first seven and take a grab here. Yeah. Not that bad, but then you get what I mean. I'm exaggerating. <laughs> but I don't think that's far from the truth. Yeah, so if you want to drop by in mainland um, to have better food than the island, 
Um, feel free to give me a call. Uh, I don't think my number is out there, but you can just email me. Uh, I also my name cuts here. Uh, we can chat further how to collaborate, how to work together, how to bring in real real world relevance, how to you know make data science more sexy and appealing for kids. Are you telling us you are not sexy? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And you can also join the Slack community and go on with the discussion on the Slack community. Yeah, yeah shameless plug in. <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah, because I have more questions but I have no time. So, uh... <laughs> come on. Okay, thanks. The two speakers again. I have a mouse if you want. Mickey, we have a clicker? Oh, like, uh, no, we don't. Oh, no. Sorry. No, we don't have it. Uh, what? I have a mouse. Oh, okay. Hello, uh, I'm Naresh. So, I'm a data scientist um, who work for a digital analytics agency called the White Room Analytics. Uh, we're actually based here in the ACAD. Um, without really going into like a lot of detail, like a brief, brief background on myself, um, I came into data science because I started off doing uh, financial mathematics in uni. Um, at the time, the intention was to sort of go become like a quantitative analyst, except when I was graduating, uh, it was just after the global financial crisis. So quantitative analyst, if you know what it is, became sort of like a dirty word and no one really wanted to go work in finance anymore. Um, so data science was coming up, and that's sort of like where I went into, uh, that's how I ended up here. Uh, most of my experience has been working with financial related data. Um, it's sort of, I've sort of like gradually moved around, so now most of the work we do is related to computer vision and neural networks. Um, and at the moment, like I said, um, we are, I'm currently running along with uh, one of my partners, Jian Tong, over there, a digital analytics agency here in the ACAT. Uh, the idea is that we meet a lot of people who are kind of interested in getting like their web apps, their mobile apps, more geared towards like the data age and stuff. What to do? So we do consulting for them, um, and like we just that. Uh, we also have like our own um, object detection software. Uh, so like we have a digital security system, which we are currently branching off as its own startup. Um, my personal interest at this point is um, sort of like along these lines. Basically, I just really love the tech. Um, so, so I almost take offense to the idea that like data science is not sexy, because to me it's like, <laughs> like right? Um, yeah. um, but basically, for this talk, it was kind of hard because I've been to like a lot of these similar kind of talks, and every one of them almost follows the same sort of like mold. You turn up and someone gives you like a brief insight into what is data science, you can do this, 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 but everyone's kind of afraid to show you what data science actually looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and sort of the way it's kind of started to be described more regularly is with those three, that, that sort of like Venn diagram you see there. Um, and one of the things I want to sort of like be part of you today is that you really can't have data science without all three of these. You need to have the domain expertise, and I think this is sort of what your question is asking about just now. Like, how do you take this data science, like these, this math and this computer science, and put it into the real world, right? You can't do any of that unless you actually know the field that you're trying to apply it to. You cannot run away from mathematics. Um, this is probably the one issue I see the most in young people who are trying to get into data science, um, especially, particularly those who have maybe been trained over the years to think that mathematics is hard and intimidating, um, which is exactly what sort of like David was describing just now. Um, it's probably nowhere near as hard as you think it is. Um, I don't think our schooling system appropriately teaches kids how to learn mathematics, because the, the whole textbook, like memorizing formulas approach, is completely wrong. Um, and also, obviously, you can't run away from computer science because the whole idea of data science is that 
you have these models which have been around for like a really long time. Uh, you now have all these new data sets which you can collect because we have the internet. Um, whether it's computer, uh, whether it's like camera recordings, voice recordings, or just tons and tons of health data, financial data, sales data, of all sorts, and now you have really powerful computers that you can process these huge data sets of. So a lot of the models that sort of have come around recently, like neural networks have actually been around for like 20, 30 years. They just weren't used before because we didn't have computing power for them. So basically, like the point of this session, um, with this long introduction, this slide will actually play. Keep okay. on. Like it's basically three views few things. Um, to try and make machine learning as a whole as black box, because I think a lot of people sort of hear machine learning but they have absolutely no idea what it actually is. Um, to sort of point out that you can't really get machine learning or analytics, um, which is I think a misconception a lot of people have. They are basically very similar sides of the same coin. Um, a lot of the models that use in machine learning algorithms can be applied in predictive analytics and they'll probably give you better insights into your data sets than stuff than just rudimentarily going through them with traditional science models. Um, to see that, again, it's these three things that come around again and again, mathematics, computer science, and the amounts of data that you have. And also, to sort of like bring you towards the realm of like gradient boosting trees, which are probably the most versatile models that will actually be used in practice that you probably have not heard of. Um, yeah. So, Basically, I want to show you like the progression of how the mathematics works in practice, right? So we'll go through like very briefly three types of models. These are three pieces of paper in like a very, very long book of statistical models that you can choose from. But this is to try and help you understand um, what's actually going on in like a machine learning application. Um, I've also chosen not to do neural networks because there's so many resources around on neural networks, even though most of the jobs will probably need you to use gradient boosting trees more than neural networks. Um, yeah. So to sort of like get some picture in your head, imagine like a data set. So this is probably the most common starter data set anywhere you'll find. Um, this is from Kaggle. So Kaggle is like the data science community for anyone who doesn't know. Um, this is a really small data set. This is something you could do very effectively on a statistical regression. Um, there's 11 variables, one target, and 892 rows. Basically, if you, whatever model you come across, you'll find that I think like the odds of your survival on the Titanic apparently are determined by your sex and almost nothing else. Um, so I think it was like 80% survival rate around, um, among women and like 20% among men, um, which was reflective of the times. Um, and the problem across all machine learning models is basically to take this, this input, um, this, and you want to split your training set into, it, split your data set into like a training set and a test set. There are other situations where you have like a validation set, but like let's keep it simple for now. Um, and essentially the things you always need to decide are how do you fit a model to this specific data set? How do you predict whatever future outcomes? Um, and how do you understand the variables it takes. So I thought a lot about how to reduce the amount of the amount of mathematical notation present um, to like as little as possible. But I think I've basically established that if you really want to know about machine learning, you can't you, you can't like throw this stuff away. Um, and if anyone is interested in getting more into like the math side, this is hopefully like a really simple introduction. Um, yeah. And essentially the outcomes looking for are how do you estimate the outcome? So in this case, you're basically trying to figure out like whether someone survived. So what you do is you would remove that survive column, the second from the left. You would train your model on the rest of it, or up until a certain number of rows, and then you test the whole thing on the remaining rows to figure out 
the survival rate or the probability of surviving for the people in your test set. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That's basically every machine learning problem everywhere. Um, in the context of like steps, again, this is almost every machine learning problem everywhere. Like this is a bit of a simplification, but like if you leave with like nothing else, probably remember this that every machine learning algorithm has one mathematical mo model, one optimization algorithm, and it quite likely has a validation set. Um, and this is something you'll want to sort of memorize because when you get into bigger data sets uh, with much more variables, this is going to get very, very complicated, but you will essentially always have this. So, so with that, like, we sort of go into like our first super basic model. Um, this is what you call like a decision tree regression. Um, so has anyone here, does anyone here not know what a decision tree is? Okay, like I think it was covered in school, but it was a long time ago, so I don't really remember. Um, and I've learned a lot of mathematics since then. Um, but essentially, it's just you have your data set, you make a split, if it's in this side, you get one value. If it's in this side, you get another value. So on that plot line, there's like a funky looking math mathematical equation that you have in. Um, that thing on the right hand side, so this is probably standard mathematical notation that you try to learn through most machine learning courses, you'll probably come across at some point. So my advice in general is Again, kind of like back to what David was saying, like don't get intimidated by this stuff. Um, it's no, if you sit down with it for like an hour and you come across a notation like this, it's perfectly reasonable. Um, the reason it's sort of like put like this is to get it into more effective mathematical notation. All it's saying is that you have this tree with, which is a bunch of values multiplied by an indicator function. So if let's say I have a point in um, so, so back to like the Titanic example, right? Let's say I have one person, and I'm trying to figure out if that person survived the Titanic. Basically, that person will have all those variables, like those x's. So you add all those different nodes um, and end up with the probability. So if this person was, let's say, male, there would be like a um, one of those ci things, which refers to that person being a male, and it'll be a zero if that person is not. Yeah, that's approximately what this thing is saying. Um, yeah, and so, so this is sort of like the most simple version of a machine learning model. And again, back to like those two steps. Um, yeah, like the mathematical model and the optimization algorithm. Yeah, so the optimization algorithm for this is usually, I mean, you have a lot of choices, but a standard choice is uh, and to be, uh, don't really worry about what that means. It's basically just saying that uh, you're looking for like the, the, the node that gives you the least um, amount of loss at each branch. Um, for, for like a higher level picture, you have this tree, it is splitting along which lines the computer decides is going to give you the most accurate one. Yeah. Um, in theory, this is approximately what it looks like. Um, this is taken from an example um, that I think was on um, cost of production. Yeah. I think it was from a supply chain. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so back to the model. Um, this is sort of what the model will look like when you try and plot it and make it intuitive in the real world. So, as mentioned, if you have, let's say, a really simple like two-dimensional space, with just like your points and your x and your y, and everything's perfectly organized, this is how your model is going to be trying to estimate it, right? So the depth here is the number of branches in this tree, uh, or the number of nodes that is allowed to be had in this tree. 
Um, so in total, the size of this tree will always be sort of like the number of acceptable leaves to the power of the, num uh, the maximum depth you're allowing it to go to. Um, as you can sort of like see, this model, because it's very simple, doesn't really do a very good job of explaining the relationship. Like if you look at this, it's pretty obvious like how you would draw it if you had like a free hand, right? Um, but because this is just sort of like fitting like very straight lines, um, that's the best it can do. And it's two examples, one is an overfit, the other one is an underfit. So the blue line is an underfit, uh, the green line is an overfit. Um, it's a very easy model to get going in because you've probably seen a decision tree before. It's very easy to understand. It has very few parameters you have to look at and there's very little mathematics. Um, so if anyone here is sort of like trying to look for an easy first problem, I would strongly suggest just trying it with a simple decision tree. Which brings us to like a slightly more complicated version. Um, and I think the point here is basically just to see how the mathematics sort of like grows up bit by bit to make this really poor estimator become something that looks a lot more like what the data is actually like in practice, in real life. Um, so this is very similar to the previous one, except instead of just using a constant, like a flat line, you're at each of these points, you're now using a linear, uh, uh, like a linear function, like a slanted line, as opposed to like straight or flat. Yeah. Um, again, use a very similar sort of optimization metrics. Um, and this is, again, a very, it's a class of much more complicated uh, version of models, sort of like generalized linear models. Um, so this, again, would be like one page in like a long book um, of the type of models you could apply in practice. But the main thing that you probably want to see here is that by improving the mathematics just a little bit, you get functions and algorithms which much, much better explain underlying data, right? Um, so just by allowing the functions that you had to become lines, you can approximate a polynomial curve like that very effectively. Um, and this is, again, like the, the point here is that if you really want to get good at this, the mathematics is key. Um, and you'll probably need to know at least this level very, very comfortably um, yeah, to sort of get going. Yeah. Um, this is the end of the comparison. Um, and this is just by a small improvement in the complex model just now. Um, and very similar to the previous one, if you remember, like the only difference is the machine learning algorithm. Like the pre-processing pre step and the output, the things that you're looking for, are almost exactly the same. Are actually exactly the same in this case. Yeah. Um, so this model, although it's a lot better, um, and I think it's probably like the standard model that you could probably try to reasonably um, implement by yourself if you're serious about getting going into machine learning and analytics. Um, it's almost always better than like the simple version that you saw just now. Um, and in general, it's a pretty powerful static complexity algorithm. Um, it's pretty easy to explain. Don't know if I'm doing a good job at it, but in, in the general context, this is sort of considered like very static complexity for a model. Um, and it's also got a very manageable parameter space. So you're not like spending days and days looking for hyperparameters, um, which is basically yeah, so, so your M's and your C's, those are what you call parameters in this model. Or, or in this case, because it's sort of like optimized with your parameters, you don't really have to look for Yeah. Um, and the drawbacks, again, uh, this is standard complexity, so it's not very useful in like higher dimensions. And for those, you typically use much, much more powerful problems. Um, algorithms. One of them is sort of like this one. Um, and this is sort of where all of this starts to build up, right? So, so we use those like really simple models just now, um, and you increase the complexity like bit by bit by bit, you'll, channel, you'll essentially end up at something like this, and this has sort of been one of the big breakthroughs in terms of 
static computing tools that you have in machine learning. Um, so I think every single tabulated data competition on Kaggle for like the past three years has been won by a gradient, gradient boosting tree um, of some sort. Um, it's extremely flexible. There's a lot of mathematics involved. You don't actually need to know all the mathematics to implement it. So the implementation has become really, really simple. But to implement it well, you will have to sort of understand where this model is coming from. Um, so this is a subclass of what you call like a generalized additive model. So basically, all you're doing is those decision trees that you had just now, like the first model. You're taking one of these trees. You're fitting it a very, very simple model of this tree to your data set. And this data set could have like a million rows, right, for example, and a million columns. Tens of millions of rows and a million columns. That's entirely possible. You take that and you fit like a really simple tree which could maybe stretch like 20 nodes, which is never going to capture all of your data, right? But what you do then is you take this tree, you fit it, you look at what has been left behind, and then you take another tree, exactly like the first one, and you optimize it the exact same way. And you do that again and again and again and again. Um, and this is, again, like another point where the mathematics comes in handy. Um, essentially, you're sort of like pushing whatever is left over by your weak models down and down and down and down. Um, and these models, in general, if they are tuned well, um, have, have just sort of like blown off um, problems that, that have been around for like quite a while. Um, so before this, it was this thing called a random forest. Random forests are very, very good models, um, but very interesting trees that sort of like taken over as like the standard. Um, yeah. Um, and in that model, so again, like the, the means there are your uh, trees, basically. And the lambda, um, the, the squiggly line there. Um, again, don't be intimidated if you see these things, like they're just letters, they're just Greek letters. Um, Lambda is just the learning rate that you apply to this tree. Um, it's sort of like a weight. You can think of it that way. Yeah. Um, and as powerful as model is, it's and as easy as it is to kind of get going, to really sort of get into it, you kind of need to know a lot about it. Um, so it can be kind of hard to program these because you have a very large parameter space. Um, so in that visual up there, you're looking at those trees, right? So one thing is, and this is in theory probably like a very good looking tree. Um, so basically what this is saying is that on that lower point, this thing has actually gone quite deep. But it hasn't been forced to do that on all of the other nodes, which is what happens when you tend to overfit. And if you underfit, then they all sort of like look like that, for example. Um, and this is all from like choices that you have to make along the road towards uh, parameterizing all of these. Um, I would say if you're interested in getting going on this, you can actually just get find a data set and apply one of these and learn as you go, because that's honestly what I did. Um, I think the first like 20 models that I tried to train basically were horrendous. Um, but you will get better. Um, and reading through on the mathematics, which actually is not that advanced, um, will definitely help you a lot. Um, most of this, I think I just said. Um, again, back to yeah. In terms of like structure, as before, it's basically exactly the same. The only thing that's changed is the machine learning algorithm. Um, and this is sort of like a visualization of what I was trying to describe just now. Um, so you can see on like the very first iteration where the first tree is being hit, it's sort of like just doing like this really basic tree. Um, but what you then do is you take that line and you sort of like minus all the remaining points. Or you have that, have the points and you minus the line and then you get the second, uh, you get the residual and then you apply another tree to like those residuals and on and on and on. And towards the end, uh, it basically cuts like cuts up vast majority of like the, um, it shouldn't be 
in the perfect world of Cutter Hobby Boys. Um, yeah. And I think this is the sort of thing that you'd be probably be looking at on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if you are, for example, in this field of data science where you're dealing with a lot of time related data, um, again, like there are a lot of other data job, data science jobs that don't use this regularly. Um, but if you're doing machine learning, I would say this is probably um, something you should be pretty comfortable with. It has pretty easy implementation. So like the main algorithms of these are so like pushed out by Microsoft and I can't remember who produced X Reboots. Um, but basically they put out like TensorFlow, for example, um, a version of TensorFlow for this kind of data set. Um, yeah. So drawbacks, as mentioned, it's very black box, so which basically means it's kind of hard to explain. And the sort of thing that is in all honesty kind of hard to interpret as well. So even once you build the model, it can honestly be days before you fully go through what you have built um, in order for you to retrain it or retest with different parameters and go through it again. Um, and optimization of parameters is sort of like the, the big thing you need to figure out. Yeah. Um, and also, yeah. Um, so the word ensembles there is basically like a group of models. So. One really, really powerful thing about this kind of model is that you can actually merge it very well with other types of models. So it's become standard to, in a lot of situations, to sort of like pre-process some of your variable set with neural networks to produce like new sets of variables that only non-linear functions, which in theory is what a neural network is, could find, and then run the whole thing through on a gradient boosting machine. Um, that's actually also how a lot of casualty competitions are won. Yeah. Um, so in general use cases for these, you basically see them in across the spectrum. Um, so one example was actually my previous job. Uh, I was a data scientist for UrbanZoom, which was a research, um, property research company in Singapore. Um, we basically use this daily. Um, and you're basically trying to apply this model on terabytes of data. Um, another very common example, retail sales. I think there was like a Kaggle competition. I can't remember which one. It was on retail sales. Um, credit scoring was a retail, there was a Kaggle competition. Um, like basically any situation where you have like a traditional regression or classification problem, you can use ranges of these models um, and be all applicable. small things. Um, bit more clarification. Uh, sorry, since I thought I had a bit more time. Um, extending the concept of gradient boosting, so as mentioned, you can like, take these and merge them with a lot of other models. They're really powerful and dexterous in that way. Um, you can also use the concept of ensembling in general, which is what you, if you're serious about machine learning, you'll probably need to like, get used to. Um, and why I personally, when I hear people say that like, there's neural networks and like deep learning and then like there's all this other statistical stuff. I kind of disagree. Um, to me, they're all just models that you need to learn how to use and understand. Um, Scarter calculus used to be like really powerful. Um, a lot of that has almost been taken away in a lot of problems by machine, by um, more powerful uh, combinations of like neural networks and gradient boosting trees, but it's still very prominent in finance. Um, and also SVM is also really powerful um, for sparse data. So just sort of like broaden the horizon a bit after I've talked about all these trees. This was put up by like um, Microsoft Azure last year to give you an idea of how many models there are out there. Um, I don't know every single thing here, just putting it there. Um, but I would say this is a good starting point to sort of like learn which ones are like most useful for like your problems. Yeah, uh, and this is sort of like stuff. Um, more for someone who's interested in seriously getting into machine learning, 
Um, and so like that's what they were saying, like don't be intimidated. Um, don't be, don't beat yourself up if it doesn't work in like two hours. Um, Cause to get into this, it tends to take like a really long time. Um, and I, with all my mathematics, basically had to like learn programming for, for like a year. Um, on top of like mathematical programs that I knew from before. Um, yeah, in terms of the mathematics that helps you the most, uh, statistics, probability, discrete mathematics, if you're interested in neural networks. Um, I would suggest if you are yet to get into a language to get to Python. Um, so I started off with R um, until I just basically just realized how much more powerful Python is. Um, I realized that probably like R people here who are like, oh my god, I hate you. Uh, how do you say this? Um, in my experience, like Python is just so much more versatile. Um, and you can extend Python beyond like your immediate desktop a lot faster. Um, also knowing, uh, so if you're from like a C, C++ or Java background, that actually is very, very handy. Um, Cause all the concepts are really powerful um, in machine learning language. Um, cloud computing, this is something I think a lot of people maybe probably lack the most, but this has close to become kind of like the standard. Um, because for a lot of like the really big data sets that you want to work through, unless you have like this huge data machine on you filled with like a hundred thousand bucks in GPU power, um, cloud computing is the easiest way to get the power necessary. You'll probably also need to know like the basics of computing powers that CPUs being used, and now Google has this new thing called tensor cores. Um, so yay, more things to learn. Um, but also, ultimately, like it's okay to be learning. Like I'm also still very much learning um, at this point. Um, I think a lot of what I know now, I did not know four years ago when I just started like experimenting in data science. Yeah, uh, and yeah, basically is this. I think uh, if you are intimidated by cloud, you can get free credits from Loop G Cloud and AWS. I can think you can get like three hundred dollars free, three hundred USD, which is enough to experiment with. Um, Books, if you want the mathematical background, elements of statistical learning, I would say is really, really good. It's like 20 years old, but as I said, most of the models haven't really changed that much. So if you want like a good grounding, this will cover everything. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I contact details I can give you if you are interested in coming talk to me after. Questions? Okay. Yes. Thanks. It really depends on the problem you have. Um, to again, yeah, to, to to figure out, for example, like if someone's about the Titanic, like that 800 rows is probably enough. That is, I think it was like one kilobyte in data size. If you want to figure out, like let's say, who's um, which customers you should be focusing on um, for like a really massive multinational company, that data set can grow to terabytes, thousand gigs. In really large organizations, like it's not unusual to see like petabytes worth of data, uh, yeah, which is like a billion gigs. And also, um, yeah, yeah. For, for, for computer vision problems, that number is basically like times 10 because of the storage. Good, I have questions. Yes. Uh, can you go back to the last slide? No, the, the one before, sorry. No, the one before. Okay. Oh my god, okay, so whatever. Uh, yeah. um, you were talking about interpretability, right? Yep. So one of the, the cute thing about uh, a single decision tree is that you can actually read it, <coughs> right? Yeah. Based on the data, right? Yeah. Okay, while if you do random forest or like a random thing or whatever, yep. then you totally lose interpretability. Yeah. So it has also implication on what you can do with it, right? An example is you put credit score in. So you can have a data scientist on the back office doing a super fancy model, and then you give that to the front office, and the guy in front of the guy says, "No, sorry, your credit score is zero. You cannot, but you cannot 
give an explanation, right? Yeah. So I guess there is also like other, like we were talking about uh, topics that are in data science, yeah. but not straightforwardly related to yeah. our analysis. Yeah. So that's, I guess, one of them, right? Yeah. Um, so, 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 uh, yeah, sorry, I'm just so like used to shouting. Um, yeah, so, so one thing that you often need to do, I think, and this sort of like gets missed a bit, is once you have this model, like that's sort of like not the end of it, because the main thing you want to do with this model is then to dissect it somehow. Um, and in most cases, you'll find that most of the reasons for a specific scoring, you have to break down to individual components. So it's not enough in most cases to just have like this big black box model. Like this is really good for skipping like 20 steps. So instead of having to like build from the base and go like variable by variable by variable over like a thousand variables to come up with which ones are most important, which is what just statisticians used to do, uh, you just throw them into this one algorithm, assuming it's well optimized, and then you will know which ones are causing your predictions. Yeah. To, to give a comment on that, yeah. so like uh, in Peter Chart, we tried something like that also, yeah. but uh, we started at the beginning with thinking of what would be the output. So the output is my marketing team, and my marketing team, they will say, okay, well, but I want, uh, I want to contact the users. So I want, for example, to know if they are creating things, or if they came often, or something like that. But if you go with a like, very complex model, you cannot answer easily this kind of question. So the choice of the model is, in fact, influenced by the output itself. Uh, to an extent, yes. I I'm probably biased because I have not actually worked much with marketing people, for example. Um, but I would say you could very, you could just do both. Because um, I mean, ultimately, you still want to always have like the appropriate science model, right? And that's kind of like where the word science is. Um, you kind of, yeah. I, I would say both would be pretty informative. Um, yeah. Questions. Okay, I have other questions. Uh, yeah, I'm very good at it. Uh, so coming back to the, the tree itself, uh, like one thing maybe, if, I, if I'm correct, uh, one of the advantages of, of trees is also that uh, you can easily deal with variables that are categorical, so for example, male, female, and things like that, as well as numerical one, compared to other models like I don't know, neural networks that are taking you need to transform the data first for getting to the top. Yeah. Can, can you comment on that? Uh, I mean, when you, when you break up the neural network, there will very, I mean, it depends on how you classify it. Like, you, you can very likely still have, like, your one on encodings at the end of it, right? You can always just, like, merge those two with whatever you had left over from your previous numerical processing. Can you, maybe for those who are, yeah. don't know, okay. who are not encoding? Okay, uh, so, so one hot encoding is basically where you like take a bunch of categorical va variables, um, like let's say boy and girl, and you split them up into like boy as one variable, so you just get a one, and girl, you get a, like a one. Um, if you do this like messily, and this is sort of like the standard approach to sort of like expanding your data set. Um, if you do this the wrong way, you can end up uh, having like too many columns, which just sort of like creates noise, um, or just slows down the model unnecessarily. But, and again, this is back to where like knowing the mathematics of how the model works makes a huge difference. So, in the situation that he's talking about, for example, neural networks typically, if you use them straight out of the box, don't really lend themselves to categorical data. You need like numbers on a range. Um, one way, though, that has been used in uh, a common use of neural networks, for example, though, is like right at the end, for example, if you're trying to predict a dog, for example, and this is the sort of problem that neural networks do, like they do computer vision. So at the end, you'll have like dog uh, or not dog, right? That is where you could sort of like push your categorical variables in um, and then merge your neural network model into like the larger ensemble. If you want to know more details, like happy to explain that. On the Slack community. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <coughs> Other questions? No? Okay. Other question. Yeah. Uh, so in, in in fact there was something a little bit funny uh, in the in the presentation. So 
the, the curves that you are showing, right? Like uh, the, yeah, this one for example. Yeah. So, so in fact, it's it's fitting the curve, right? Okay. Uh, which is slightly different from the the example we were. I mean, the the, the general framework for uh, calculating probabilities, right? So trees are in fact good for both. You can both like fit like a specific numerical value. So for example, cost, and you can also predict probabilities. So yeah. any comment on that? Uh, not really. Like I think okay. I think in practice you kind of like, or at least I have sort of like learn to like and this is probably the maybe a bad thing like I've learned to like use probabilistic interpretability um, as long as the numbers can't like match up. Um, because ultimately you can still do operations on like the outputs to put them into whatever scale you need. So so if you in, in this particular case which is like curve fitting, so there are many other like possibilities. So instead of using like a basis of trees, you can use like Gaussians or wavelets or something like that. Why, why using trees, for example, for regression compared to other techniques? Is there a... Well, I mean, trees are simple. Okay. Yeah. But it's also, simple in, in, in what sense? Like, I don't know. So, so like, the technical term would be weak, right? Um, with more complex models, you're typically going to... So, so this comes back to, like, the ensemble um, and, like, the generalized the model. So you, you want, like, the weakest model that can fit reasonably and scale, right? If you have like a bunch of other models that you try and fit, you can't really control as well what the instance is doing at each step of the curve, right? But for example, if you if you fit by Gaussians, you are depend only on the variance and the uh, and the mean values, so like, it, it's pretty straightforward to uh, to fit, right? You mean fit by Gaussian this data set? Yeah, for example. So instead of like each tree, what you say? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, a linear combination of uh, of gauchos or wavelets, for example. They are very effective uh, algorithms for that, right? Okay. I thought so. Like long time ago, when I was doing physics, that's right. the kind of stuff that we were doing. But yeah. okay. Uh, I mean, again, it's entirely possible there are. Um, my experience with classic algebra is that they typically get used for different variations of the problem. Okay. Um, but yeah. Because I had the, the same question, I saw this as a classification problem, yeah. right? And for me, this is a logistic, a logistic regression problem. So how did you get to, is it back to just viewpoint, you know, resource utilization that decision trees are easier than a logistic regression approach? Or? I mean, this is almost like a manufactured, manufactured example, right? Because um, like a, 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 in real life, you would not use a gradient descent on this. Right, because um, right. again, how would you represent 1,000 columns in this, right? Even if you extend it to like three columns, um, and if you have like funny shapes like that, so we'll four, how do you represent four? So, so the, 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 like it comes down to like the, the, the dimensionality of the data. Yeah. Like th this is illustrative. Um, like it, it's the same concept. You could probably very easily apply a logistic regression. Let's do it again, yeah. So that's Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, like the main point would be that like the residuals are being like fit bit by bit. Question from the audience? We have a few more minutes. Can we go back to the problem of a clean data set? And maybe that's not what you wanted to cover tonight, so you said no off topic. Let's, let's not talk about it. But I mean, what, what's that process look like when somebody, you know, one of your clients says, hey, we want to do something with this, you know, just be walking through with what you get into, looking at what they've got. Uh, so it depends on the kind of data set, for example. Well, I think maybe you start out saying, you know, most of the time you, know, you, you get a, a, a dirty data set or you, you just, you don't, you, you can't work with everything you've got. So I assume there's some assumptions that need to be made about what we do. Like, like this, this is a clean data set. Right. And as you mentioned, like that pre-processing is sort of like a completely different conversation. Um, that that often takes like a really long time. Um, right. And those are probably business decisions about how do we treat whatever fields or uh, business, but also the person who's recording the data. Um, it usually comes down to like the program of the program, the original. Um, 
software's preference for how he thought the data would best be recorded. All right, and, yeah. and if they're still collecting data, right, then you can change how you're doing that. Okay. Um, I mean, to, to tell it, in terms of what we get, for example, um, for ex we, we get data that's just like horrendously organized. Um, and we have like our clients give us like 600 gigs of data. Um, but to process, like the job was basically just to, to run all of this through some kind of network um, and then put that into machine learning model. But like the data processing itself on the 600 gigs um, took me like three weeks. Right, I imagine you spend half the time scratching your head and saying, what do we have here and how do we organize this so we can use it? Yeah, yeah, and also just like making sure that I've all, yeah, making sure you can use what you've organized but also reorganizing it in the right way. But, but that, that's completely different. Yeah. Yeah, if I can comment on that. That's the beauty of the math, because the math that gives you a general framework, as long as you give like the right format, then you know what you are doing. So the, the problem of data cleaning is that you have totally random stuff, and you want to bring it into the right format for, for the model. And, and that's where it's complicated, is that you, you can't really give like a general framework for that, because it depends on how the data set has been produced at the first place. While once you reach the point where you have the right format, you know that you have all this arsenal of tools that come from the, from the model themselves. So I mean, general framework is quite complicated, I think. Remarks, comments? Oh, but it's 45 minutes anyway. So I think we can thank our speaker again. Uh, so, so that's the end of the session, in fact. Uh, at the end of the meeting. Uh, so we should have a fun meeting next month. Uh, I already have a speaker. Uh, sometime, sometime, sometime. Sometime. English is tough. Someone uh, from the Bing Institute uh, will present uh, things like uh, how platform surveys, uh, how data are collecting. So coming back to your, uh, to your point about local data set and things like that, Maybe something that will really resonate uh, to, uh, to your students, for example. Uh, I potentially look for a second speaker. Uh, if no one is ready to make a presentation, I have uh, a topic in mind, which is in fact related to data cleaning, uh, something you know like that uh, we run uh, during the DTEC workshop, which is uh, how to uh, take uh, a not so clean Excel file and how to uh, tidy it up into something which is more useful, for example, for, for machine learning models and stuff like that. So it's, it's very basic, but I'll give you all the steps uh, within Python. So if you are interested, please join the Slack community and, uh, and let me or let us know like, the kind of topics that you would like uh, us to treat. Okay. Uh, once again, thanks for coming. Uh, fill the survey if you were not there before. Uh, send an email to flavian at pictochart.com if you want to join the Slack community. And please, if you are there, feel free to share information, articles, ask questions if you have. And we will put the presentations, the two presentations from today, in the Slack community, uh, in the Slack channels also, for you to take a look at. Okay. Ah, I, we have a question on the back. Yes. Yeah, you can just let, let it there and then we will process it. That's manual processing. <laughs> yeah, so, so the, the reason why we do it this way, uh, because I was saying that uh, uh, manual filling is more efficient than uh, web forms. So if you guys think that no, it's not true, that's, not, that's a myth or whatever, then we can have, in fact, like a web form when you can input your stuff. Then we get the email and, uh, and we go through. But yeah, yeah. So maybe for the next, we will go with a with a web one. Okay. But yeah, like let put your email uh, so that then we can reach you. And then if you want to join the Slack community, I send you an invite. Okay. Any more questions?
No? Okay, so I see you next month.